Thank you so much again, Vicki and Michelle, for being here with us tonight. We are excited to see what you have to make for us. So Vicki, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's so nice to be with all of you tonight. And um, I'm very excited about sharing the recipes that Michelle and I are going to be making. The three recipes I'm making are actually part of my new cookbook that was just published in May, which is called the Plant Based for Life Cookbook. I'm going to move it out of my way. But um, all of those, the recipes that I'm making tonight are actually in this book. The first one that I'm starting with is something that I call the, a Grand Slam tempeh burger. And it's a really delicious um, burger. And the reason I kind of call it a Grand Slam is because it's really sort of a perfect, to me, meal all in one because it includes tempeh, which is just a really lovely um, protein that um, is just uh, very suitable for this kind of thing to create burgers out of. And also it's got spinach. So you've got your vegetables and it's also got sweet potatoes. So it's my Grand Slam tempeh burger with spinach and sweet potatoes. And we're just gonna dive right into that. So we need a food processor for this. Although I actually did talk to somebody who didn't have a food processor who made this burger and just used a knife to kind of cut things very small by hand. But I do think that a food processor makes this quite a bit easier. So it's a really simple dump everything all into one bowl kind of a, a, a recipe. And I'm starting with a block of tempeh. And you can buy tempeh, which is a fermented soy product at uh, your grocery store, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, Kroger, wherever you do your shopping. And I just like to score the back of it a couple of times just to open up the plastic wrap. And then I've got four pieces that I'm just going to um, add to my food processor bowl. So I'm starting with tempeh and then I'm adding to that um, I say a small onion in the recipe, but the truth is any size onion, really the more the better. I, I've made it with a small onion and that works, but I'm adding a Vidalia onion, which is really my favorite when you can get a sweet onion. And it's not a huge onion, it's probably somewhere between a small and a medium um, tonight, but any, I think kind of the more onion, the better. You could add garlic to this. Again, it's kind of uh, Michelle and I like to call these sort of template recipes because you can really customize and add and subtract whatever you like or whatever you might have even on hand. So now to that, I'm going to add a couple of cups of baby spinach. But again, you could add power greens or baby kale or something else. Um, about two cups, I don't even measure it. I'm just calling it. And you'll notice that I had a piece of paper towel on the top of the box of the um, greens in order to just kind of keep the condensation at a minimum. I'm adding roughly half a box without even measuring it. It's roughly to my, about two of my handfuls is uh, roughly two cups. I've measured it a couple of times and just kind of go with that as my um, general measurement. So we're gonna add now, so I've got my tempeh, my onion, my spinach, and now I'm going to add to that a medium sweet potato. And I'm saying that in my recipe, I call it steamed, but today I just microwaved it and it's just nice and soft to the fork. I peeled it and maybe I'll just break that up into a couple of pieces before I put it in here, but um, just kind of a rough, mixture is going to work. Rough pieces, large pieces that are all blendable. And then to that now I'm going to add our, our final ingredient. So I've got a little flaxseed meal, a third of a cup, and I added my seasoning. So I added a little salt and a little Creole seasoning to that as well. The salt and Creole are optional if you choose not to. Um, the flax is going to bind it together, so it'll hold, help to hold the burgers together. And now I'm finishing it off with a little balsamic vinegar, which I think really goes well to kind of almost marinate while it is baking um, to add some nice flavor. So now I'm going to make a little bit of noise with my food processor as we start to blend this.
And just that quickly, it's about done. I'm going to take a look and make sure. And what happened, because there's so much in here, it's so full of ingredients, that some of the ingredients towards the top of the bowl didn't really get inside. So I'm going to just scrape it down once and do another quick round. That's it. We're all blended and we're ready to make our burgers. So what I'm going to do now for safety is pull out the blade. And then we will take this mixture, which looks like this at this point. I want it a little bit chunky, not all the way homogenized for texture so that we can have our burgers have little specks of color that will be the tempeh, the spinach, the onions, and the sweet potatoes. And although you wouldn't need to at this point, I'm putting on a pair of kitchen gloves just because it gets kind of messy at this stage when we're making the burgers. It reminds me of back in the days when I was making meatloaf and things of that sort you know how sloppy that can be but just getting your hands in it sometimes is the very best way to make that mixture um, nicely mixed and well formed so now i'm going to just take these little i'm going to make a mound basically and what i'm going to try to do this actually makes 10 to 12 burgers is i'm just creating these little mounds of this batter um, and it's going to bake in the oven at 425 for roughly 35 minutes or so. Um, you know, a little more or less is fine. I find that if I, around 25 minutes, I like to flip it. I'm putting this right now on a nonstick griddle that is oven safe. It's actually made by ScanPan. Sometimes people ask me what brand I like. And it's a really nice brand that um, is very forgiving in the oven without using any oil or parchment paper or anything like that. So you can take two pans full, you could make them smaller, you could make little, you know, little mini bites out of this if you wanted to. But I'm making these larger patties that I'm going to bake, as I mentioned, for roughly 35 minutes and um, flip them carefully in the oven at about 25 minutes. So it's gonna look like this at this stage. They're ready to put in the oven and I'm gonna show you because I just made a batch what they look like. So these are ready to turn into a really nice easy dinner or um, lunch as a nice burger and i'm going to show you how i top it off and finish it these actually um you'll notice by the way that this i've used a silpat a silicone baking sheet baking pad um, mat that is um, makes it very easy to flip these as well so now we've got this all done you can see I've got extra batter left over. I can do another batch. I could refrigerate them at this point or um, even freeze them, or I could cook all of them up and then they're all ready to enjoy all week long. And so now just to um, serve it, to plate it, we're gonna take, I like to use a half of an Ezekiel muffin, which is, an English muffin that is a grain, you know, whole, very whole grain, um, chewy kind of a base. You could use anything you like. You could even use a lettuce wrap or, you know, a tortilla or whatever you like. I'm moving a couple things out of the way here. I like to take, here's a time, you know, to kind of use your creativity for your favorite toppings. I'm just going to use some um mustard on here i'm going to start a little base of mustard you certainly don't need to you know you can use your whatever you like i'm actually adding a little bit of a um, cream cheese that is uh made by kite hill which is an almond milk base this is a chai flavor they make uh, several flavors but i do like it because it's really quite pure of just almond milk and cultures 
And so now I've got kind of a creamy base. And I think that that cream cheese that's made by Kite Hill, it's just a brand I like, but um, doesn't have any oil in it or any other um, things that are you know, overly disagreeable. I think it kind of reminds me of that old mayo kind of an idea of something creamy on the bottom. And so now I'm gonna add, pile it up with some dill pickles, and then I'm gonna put my burgers on. And I think I'm gonna add actually two. So we're gonna really pile it up and make it a delicious burger and top it with some tomatoes, fresh tomatoes. You could put, you know, onions on here. You could put avocado, anything you like, and then some lettuce. And so I'm just going to bring it closer to the camera and show you that we've got this delicious burger ready to enjoy. Michelle? It looks wonderful, Vicki. So I just wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, Baldwin is my library, so I'm very happy to be here. Another is that... Um, about an hour ago, we had a medical emergency in my family, so I'm going to be doing kind of a shorter version of things um, because I'm going to have to leave uh, for the hospital a little bit earlier. As soon as I get the word, I am looking at my phone, which I would never usually do in a class, but I'm looking for updates. So I just want to let you know that, and then I'm going to get started. So the first uh, recipe I'm doing is carrot dogs. A lot of people, you know, we're in all different stages. I'm sure we have a lot of people here. A lot of people want miss having something they can have in a bun or take to a picnic or a cookout. And carrot dogs are really good. And some people think you mean just putting a raw carrot in a bun, and I don't mean that. I mean, we there are all different uh, recipes for different ingredients. So you know, finding the one that uh, works for you is good. But this is one from Thug Kitchen. And the idea is to marinate the, um, the carrots and get them just not soft and not crunchy, but you just want a little bit of resistance to a knife when you, you uh, puncture it. So what I'm doing, I have uh, apple cider vinegar and um, there's rice vinegar and then um, vegetable broth. I use um, one, I try to go low sodium and no oil if possible. And then to that I'm adding, um, I've got paprika, garlic powder, mustard powder, some black pepper. And then I have, you can use soy sauce. Um, I use coconut aminos a lot, soy sauce and tamari. So if you have a gluten allergy, which by the way, I love tempeh, but I have to get, the one from Trader Joe's has gluten. So I just like people to know that, but I do love tempeh and I, I make burgers with um, the, uh, I can't think of the name of it. it there's, you just look if you have a, a gluten allergy. Anyway, uh, to, regular soy sauce has gluten. Uh, tamari doesn't, but it's super high in sodium, so I'm always a fan of using coconut aminos. They've got a little bit of sweeter taste, and they're much lower in sodium. So if sodium's a concern for you, you might want to go with that. I also use uh, liquid smoke, which some people get a little worried about, but really, I use the brand that does not have any additives in it. It's just they take, this is hickory, so they take the chips, heat it up. The smoke is Full of water there's a lot of water and smoke and when the smoke hits the top of the unit it condenses and they just collect that so it's just liquid smoke some brands you need to look at they might have caramel color or other things added i just get this pure liquid smoke and it gives a nice dish it's a nice taste it makes it feel like something you cooked out so what i would normally do i just mix this up put it on the stove just for a bit this is the one thing i did not get to finish because of what happened today. So I put this on the stove until it simmers. And then I've taken carrots that you want to get bun length. I'll you know, trim the skinny end off. Although I've seen people that just put a regular old carrot skinny end and all and had it sticking out of the bun. But I try to bring it, make it a little bit more even. You can see this. So I cut the ends, I took the skinny ends off and I just kind of rounded the, the ends so it, you know, it looks a little bit more like a hot dog. And then I, after this uh, came to a simmer, I poured it over. I have all the carrots in here and I poured the mixture over and then let it marinate for you know up to 90 minutes. And then I put it in a 425 degree oven. I just want to say something about ovens because when you get a recipe that's got a certain amount of time, 
you know, you might find that doesn't mean it's definitely going to be done in that time. And I think it's a good idea. And you should check it because we, with this, you want to have a little resistance when you put the knife through. But it's a good idea to have something like this, an um, oven thermometer, because your oven can vary up to 50 degrees from if I've set this for 425, it might just register at 375. My food isn't going to be ready when I think it is. So I think it's a great idea to have one of these and check that out. So I have already cooked this. And then what I will do, um, like I said, I, this is the one thing I didn't get to finish, but I just put that in a bun, just a whole wheat bun, or you could use the Ezekiel. Sometimes we use wraps or lettuce, whatever works for you. And then whatever, um, whatever you like. I know people get kind of particular about what they put on their hot dogs. I mean, some people get up in arms if you put ketchup on it or whatever, ketchup, mustard, relish, onion, sauerkraut, whatever you like. And that's how you do it. It's got the nice, the uh, marinade makes it have that, the flavor profile of a hot dog. So it's a nice way to enjoy something at a cookout. You put it in for 20 minutes, uh, turn it, turn it over, just roll it over in the marinade. Another 20 to 25 minutes, again, checking to make sure there's just a little bit of resistance, but you want it to be tender on the inside. So um, if you want, you can eat them right away or you can put them away in the fridge for a while and heat them back up on a, on a grill. Turn that back to you, Vicki. Okay, thank you. That looks great, Michelle. And um, okay, the next thing that we're making uh, to, on my end is I call sweet and creamy cabbage and apple slaw. And this one is just kind of, again, kind of an everything in one bowl kind of a, of a dish. Um, and then we're making a dressing that goes along with it. So there's kind of two stages. So um, the first thing that we're gonna do is put into our slaw, two cups of, and you could mix and match this, it could all be one color, but I'm putting a total of two cups of green cabbage and two cups of red cabbage, and then a couple of um, approximately two carrots that are peeled and sliced. And I actually am just using the shortcut of shredded carrots that come in a bag. So I kind of eyeball, and we're gonna just mix all this into a bowl. So we are getting lots of nice color here to start with. And then to that, we're going to add some apple. So, you know, I like to take kind of a shortcut with apples um, to, you can peel them and where what we're doing here is just gonna basically getting the peel off and then dicing them. So I'm just, again, doing kind of a shortcut version. You could take your time and actually peel them with a peeler. I'm just using a knife to just kind of make it very quick work. And then I'm just gonna slice some big chunks I didn't do this ahead because I didn't want them to brown, but now we can just discard the part we're not using and quickly, you know, just create little cubes or slices or for that matter, shreds, whatever you like. We're gonna just add this to our slaw because it's going to create kind of a nice sweet and crunchy addition. And it's kind of a fun idea because you can actually add anything you like. I mean, there's no limit. It could be something kind of creamy. I have a different coleslaw that I add mango to um, that adds a little sweetness. You could add um, some other kind of, you know, could be pear, certainly could be any other vegetable that you have on hand as well. But the sweet is kind of a fun um, addition. And so I'm just going to add this um, to our bowl. And depending on how much you like of this, you could even do pineapple, by the way, that would be also really nice. Um, we're just gonna continue just slicing, chopping, anything you want, kind of making these little pieces to add to our bowl. And um, I like to have a lot of the pieces handy, you know, like a, a lot of small pieces, because I think that helps to get that flavor into every 
um, mouthful. Every bite is going to have some of the sweet and some of the crunchy. So same idea here. Just discard all of these pieces. And again, you could take your time with this more than I am here to make sure you're getting every little bite, but just kind of going more quickly to make sure we use our time well together. And then we're just gonna do a chop. Get the idea. We're gonna add all of this basically to it. And I could spend a few more seconds here to get the rest going, but you get the idea. So we're adding all of these um, pieces of apples to the cabbage uh, dual color along with the carrots. And now we'll make our dressing. So I'll continue to add the apples as we, in just a second after I switch it back to Michelle, but we'll make our quick dressing, which is a half of a cup of water into a blender um, container. And then about um, a third of a cup of raw cashews, and that's going to make it nice and creamy. And then I'm going to put in some raisins. And today, although my raisins were fresh, date wise, you know, the date on the package, they were still fresh, but they were kind of dried out. So I actually soaked them so they would get nice and soft. And so if your dried fruit is dehydrated, you know, beyond the point where it's, you know, the texture that you like, you can soak it and it will get sort of reinvigorated. So I'm adding a third of a cup of cashews, a couple of tablespoons of a brown mustard. You could actually add any mustard that you like. Okay grab a spatula. So this will add a little bit of tang to our dressing and the raisins are adding a little bit of sweetness. And then now I'm also adding a little balsamic vinegar. You could add a different vinegar. You could add a flavored vinegar. You could add a sweeter vinegar, anything you like. And just a dash of salt or you could leave it out. And now we're just going to blend this together to get nice and creamy. And our dressing is all done. It really smells good too. This is such a nice dressing because it's sweet and spicy and vinegary. So it's kind of got that sour bite as well as um, the sweetness from the raisins. And it's really nice over this crunchy slaw, nice and fresh and really very summery. I'm gonna go back and get the rest of these apples and add it back in as I'm finishing up here. But we've got all of our dressing in here and now we'll just mix this together. And it gets even better as it sits overnight for a day or a little bit later in the day if you make it earlier. And what happens with uh, vinegar and these apple pieces is that it helps it keep, um, it protects it from browning, oxidizing once it's covered with this dressing. So here we are, I'm just gonna put a little bit in a bowl. And we've got this delicious slaw. Michelle? It looks delicious as usual, Vicki. The next thing I'm making is a, a zucchini cannelloni with an um, almond herb pate. The almond herb pate is very versatile. It's a, just a raw uh, base 
that you can use in a lot of different ways. You can make a big batch and flavor sections of it differently. You can use it, uh, you can use different machines. I'll be using a food processor, but you can use a juicer. That way you don't have to add any water and that works. So if you're making a raw burger, you can use a food processor like I am or a Vitamix or something like that. So there are a lot of different options and there are a lot of different options about what you can do. I'm making it in the zucchini roll-ups. Uh, you could put it on a cracker. You could put it you know, in a, in a wrap. You can do all sorts of things with it. They're very versatile. So I think it's a really good thing to know. I have, you can use different nuts if you're allergic or you just have a different preference. We always, Vicki and I always tell you to make it your own. I've got a cup and a quarter of almonds, uh, raw almonds that I soaked earlier for a couple, like three hours and then bring them in. And then I'm using, um, okay, I know it's called, uh, three quarters cup of pine nuts. The nice combination. The base is just going to be, I'm putting in three tablespoons of lemon juice and two cloves of garlic, two cloves of garlic, okay, and some salt. I don't know if you can hear my dogs in the background. They've been up since before. We had the uh, visitors here and they're really getting tired of that. So they're talking to me. I'm just going to pulse it so I can... and then pure it. Scrape down the sides. Now, the longer you soak, the less water you need. And if you're using the, a juicer like an Omega, one of the nicer juicers, then you don't need to put any water at all in. But I'm going to put a little bit of water. And there are all different things you can add. I love basil. Basil's in just wonderful herb. Love this fragrance. Nice calming properties. So I've got a half a cup that I have shook on the end. Slice those up. And I like a little heat. So I'm putting in some uh, crushed chili. Place. Run it again. Sometimes it's kind of a coarse texture. If you want it uh, smoother than that, feel free to just keep uh, processing it. Gonna see what it looks like. Smells good. Like I said, it's very versatile. Then um, to save some time, I already did slice the zucchini. I like this mandolin a lot. I just want to caution people: if you're using a mandolin, please, please, please use the cut guard and or a cut glove because it's just the time you save not doing those things can end up with the, uh, you know some blood, we don't want that. So I use those and just cut it nice and thin. We're doing two, two slices. I'll try to make it so you can see this. Just kind of overlap the slices that. And then take a spoonful of the pate and put it about a third of the way. I'll make sure you can see me a third of the way down. And you're going to carefully lift up and then tuck in. You try to roll it as tightly as possible and keep that pate inside. I already have a dish of these. Put that in there. Just a little, oops, oops, yes. it's kind of messy, but that's okay. Just put that right onto that plate and garnish it with some parsley. I think that's a nice, pretty appetizer. You could use it for, you know, have a few of them for your meal. Nuts and seeds are uh, calorically dense, but they're also very nutrient dense. So you will get full faster on these. Uh, I do think they 
you know, I, I do really like them. It's a nice way to just, um, like, there are a lot of options you can do with these things, but it's, it's very versatile. And I hope you like that. You can use whatever nuts and seeds you like. And I think it just makes a nice presentation. I'm going to, normally Vicki and I would uh, trade off, but I'm going to leave soon. So I'm going to go on to my next one, which is uh, a creamsicle. So I used to love the push-ups when I was younger, and I used to make a version for my son. And if you uh, go to Trader Joe's, you know they have a tendency to discontinue things. They used to have this uh, vanilla soy ice cream, and it worked really well. I would just thaw out some uh, uh, orange juice concentrate, the frozen, and I would just soften it up. I've given you three different uh, variations on this theme here. I would just soften it up, put it in a bowl, and mix it up until it tasted as orange as I wanted it, and put that into a push-up mold. And let me see, these kind of things. So that's what we would do. Um, then I have for, I'm trying to cover it for everybody's preferences. I have people that don't want to eat nuts at all for health reasons. So I put, I uh, put a, a recipe here that is for a smoothie. Um, and then I, I'm going to demo a recipe showing it for an ice cream maker. Now, if you don't have an ice cream maker, you could do the first one I told you about, or, you know, you can do kind of a nice cream by substituting what the, the cashews that I'm telling you about with a frozen banana and a half cup of almond milk. I haven't tried that one, but I know that people who don't want to eat nuts like that option. So I'm putting in just a cup and a half of liquid all together. I have a cup of fresh orange juice. And here's something about our food industry. When you buy orange juice at the store that says not from concentrate, have you ever noticed that like Florida's natural always tastes the same and Simply Orange always tastes the same and Trader Joe's, Kroger, whatever you get, their brands always taste the same, but oranges don't always taste the same. They put in perfuming agents. They don't list it and that's okay. They don't have to list it, but I don't like that idea and I actually don't like the taste. So I just got my juicer out and I juice some organic Valencia oranges. I've got a cup of them, a cup of the juice, and then I'm adding another cup of water. I know where I put it. Okay. Now I'm also putting in some which I, orange zest. And if you're going to zest, I do recommend using organic because the outside is where the pesticides collect. Zest, it smells really good. If you ever like cut into an orange or you do zest or peel it, you get the release of the, the orange um, essential oil comes off there. It's a nice uplifting scent got a lot of great properties. It's got vitamins. It's got all sorts of wonderful stuff. We tend to throw out a lot of parts of our food that would really benefit us to consume. So I've got two teaspoons of orange zest. And try and be careful when you do zest it that you want to get just the outer part, not the pith, because the pith is bitter. So just the outside. Orange part, this gives it, a, this gives it an additional uh, orange flavor without using an artificial orange flavor. So doing that, I've got just about a cup of dates and I'm glad Vicki brought that up because about the raisins being dry, I've been having a hard time finding dates lately. I usually get them at Trader Joe's and it's not a good, the whole package isn't good. But when you do buy dates, I do want you, like before you use them, I always wash mine off and then I open them up. It's important to look at them because they can have little, if they're really brown inside, like a powdery brown. There are insects in there. They can have a black mold that's really not pleasant to have, but apparently it isn't harmful. But it's just important to look at it so you make sure you don't have anything like that. And if you, um, if they're a little drier, then I would soak them first. If you don't have a high speed blender, you really need to soak everything for a while, and it might not be as creamy. And I have now I have a half a cup of cashews. And I have a little over like a rounded half teaspoon of vanilla powder. I do like the powder better, but if you want to use extract, usually the rule is about twice as much extract to powder. So I would use around like a little over a teaspoon of the vanilla, but this is all to your taste. So if you want heavier on the vanilla, add more. If you want more of the orange, you can add more of the uh, orange zest. You could also, add more dates or put in some date 
syrup or whatever sweetener you choose. I'm going to run it. No, oh, I just made a batch of this earlier, so I know this combination works for me. I love it. It's nice and refreshing. Vanilla, by the way, is uh, like if you have the essential oil or just the vanilla itself is relaxing. So nice, uplifting, relaxing ingredients in here. And then what I would do is I have um, an ice cream maker. Wasn't expensive. I'm not going to run it now because I'm going to have to take it off. But I just put it in and let it run for 25 minutes. That's the instructions for my machine. And then I can put it into something like this. Vicky and I like these little containers too. They're just a nice single serving size. I like that. Or putting them in, like I said, the push ups. These have been through a lot with us over the years or putting them into a container like that, or whatever kind of popsicle mold that you would like to have. So I apologize for having to take off like this, but I have to go. So I hope you enjoy those things. I gave Olivia my uh, email address. If you have questions, you can uh, shoot me an email and I'll get back to you. All right, thank you so much. Michelle, we are all thinking about you and wishing your mom well and, um, we understand very much that you need to leave, but just know that our hearts are with you. Thank you. So I will dive into our last recipe, and that's a dessert that I'm making called chocolate strawberry brownies. And it's super easy, really healthy. There's no flour, no oil, no sugar, um, of course, no eggs or dairy or anything like that. And it's just kind of a magic um, little treat. So it's nice and easy. When our uh, food processor here tonight is doing double duty. So I'm going to add things back into this food processor bowl. And we're starting with some oats, half a cup of rolled oats. And that becomes flour as we put all of this together, but we're starting with a whole grain. And then, um, and so it's really gluten-free as well. I'm adding to that some cocoa powder or cacao, either one and a little bit of baking powder. And I'm going to run that for just a second to kind of get that, um, to get the oats to turn into a nice texture for us. And just that fast, we are down to the texture we want. I'm gonna open this kind of carefully because I have a feeling that dust will be starting to um, fly around just a little bit with this cocoa in here. So there we have a little cloud. And now to that, I'm going to add our wetter ingredients. So I'm adding one ripe banana. And if your bananas start to get ripe and you haven't um, had them yet, you haven't consumed them, you can freeze them or refrigerate them to last a little longer. If you refrigerate them, they're gonna turn black on the outside, but it actually does slow down the ripening once they're in the refrigerator. So you can use them for several longer, several more days. I'm adding a little bit of vanilla, I'm not even measuring it, but roughly two teaspoons, maybe just a little bit more. I like vanilla. And this is not in order, but you can certainly follow along in order. And now I'm adding some dates. And as it's funny that Michelle mentioned that about the dates, I'm having the same trouble with my dates. I opened a new package of dates that were kind of hard as rocks. So today I took these dates and poured over the container of dates after I measured them, some boiling water, just like you would use it to make tea. And I let it sit until they became really nice and soft. And the, the first batch that I made, which I'm going to show you in a moment um, the, today, um, I didn't do that. And so I realized I needed to 
to soak them for you, to show you that I, you know, they're just nicer. They break up nicer and mix up beautifully, kind of pulverized together uh, really well when the texture is nice and soft and moist. What happened when I was using a drier date for the first batch that I'm going to show you in a moment that I baked earlier, because they were harder, um, I actually had to add a couple of splashes of water. And you can certainly do that if you find your food processor is getting kind of stuck and not blending like you want it to. Sometimes it's just that it needs a little more liquid. So um, I just instead reversed the process so my dates would have a little more moisture rather than having to add a splash later on. So now I've got my dates in here, my banana, and here's the great part. We're adding strawberries. So I'm adding, we're using a total of about three cups of strawberries and I'm adding, I've taken off the tops of course, so they're, they're rinsed and dried and trimmed. And so I'm adding these beautiful strawberries, two cups of them, which is gonna mix into the cocoa and turn it into like the flavor of chocolate covered strawberries. It's really quite delicious. And then I'm saving one cup on this uh, separately, which we're going to use at the very end to decorate them before we put them in the oven. So now I'm going to blend them. And I've got everything here, our vanilla, strawberry steaks, bananas, that's all of our flavor and sweetener um, and, the, and the drier ingredients that we talked about a moment ago. Here, we're gonna blend. And we're done. So we've got this beautiful fudgy batter with just a hint of red in it, which could not be more delicious. It smells wonderful. I'm going to take out the blade again for safety as we start to play around in that bowl. And now we've got this beautiful fudgy batter that's all ready to turn into our brownies. And you can do whatever you like at this stage in terms of the baking containers. You could bake it in little mini muffin cups, for example. But I use, and I have a number of these in slightly different shapes, a silicone baking brownie bites pan, brownie pan. I think they're actually called a brownie bites pan. This is made by Wilton and it's like $8 or something like that on Amazon. They make more than one brand makes this, but I have used this for years. And now I actually have a couple of them because sometimes I need to make a larger batch of things. So I have a round one, a different shape by Trudeau. I have a a bar shape. I have, I think I even have a heart shape that I use around Valentine's Day. So it's really fun if you like this sort of thing to um, use because what's fun about it is that you can bake these little bite sized pieces, really great for portion control. You can also freeze them if you've got leftovers. They're really nice on a platter. Um, and they, because every, all of them are going to bake up approximately, you know, the same amount of time. I'm using now a mini ice cream scoop, which is perfect for making sure that all of these wells in the container have the approximately same amount of batter in them, kind of makes quick work. But if you don't have this little tool, you can certainly just use a spoon and that works great too. I usually, with this recipe, it kind of depends a little bit on the size of the banana and how accurate you are with your measuring of the strawberry, but it usually makes somewhere between 24 and 30, maybe sometimes a little more um, brownies. And you can kind of fill them a little bit higher if you want. I've got a little batter left, which I'll use in a different way in a moment when we're not on screen. But we've got um, now all of these in a pan and I'm just going to sort of shake them side to side a little bit to sort of help flatten them. And then we're going to use that last cup of strawberries. 
And I will say, by the way, that in, um, when, in a pinch, when I haven't had fresh strawberries I've used frozen, I think they come out a little better. I like the texture a little better with fresh, but they work with frozen as well. And now I've just taken that last cup and diced it. And I'm going to just sprinkle a few on every little square here so that we're kind of decorating the top. And when these come out of the oven, you'll see that strawberry on the top first when you start to, you know, when you get ready to serve these. And it lets anybody who's about to taste them know exactly what to expect inside. And the strawberries and the chocolate together are just really dreamy. So we're gonna just decorate all of these with a little sprinkle of the strawberries. And I usually will use, as I mentioned, like a second baking pan like this, and they can both go in the oven at the same time. So I'll save a few of these strawberries for that other pan. But then we're gonna stick this into the oven and we're gonna bake it 15 to 20 minutes-ish, somewhere in there. I baked the batch I'm gonna show you in a moment, literally, I think it was 18 today, but they look just like this as it's ready to go into the bake into the oven. And you can put this right on your oven rack. It looks a little flimsy, but it's gonna stay right where you put it. And you don't have to put it on top of anything else. I might press them down just slightly as you see me doing so that they stick to the batter just a little bit more, but they're ready to go into an oven at 375 for somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes until when you touch the top, it feels kind of like a finished baked good. I don't like to over bake. I want it to stay nice and moist, but I'm going to show you these, which I just took out of the oven a little while ago. And I actually covered them and then they start to kind of condense a little, but um, these are finished. And because they're in this silicone pan without any oil or anything like that, they will still pop out for us just by, you know, if we needed to, we could release them with a knife, but they'll pop out just like this and they're ready to enjoy a delicious little bite. I'm going to plate a few of these here so that you get the idea. And these also freeze really well. And, you know, when you're having an urge for something that's a little bit sweet if after dinner or, you know, something to serve somebody who is visiting, you can grab these and you can have a lovely, quick little strawberry brownie. And that's that. Thank you so much, Vicki. Those brownies look phenomenal. I love all of the strawberries on top. They smell so good. I oh have my to gosh. tell you. These... I bet, I bet they look amazing. I mean, I bet they taste amazing. <laughs> All right, now we can get to questions. So Vicki, the first question is someone said their blender doesn't do a great job at mixing heavier foods and they're wondering what kind of blender you have. So um, I have a Breville blender that I'm very happy with, but I, before this, had a Cuisinart, probably three of them over the years that, you know, over probably two or three decades. Um, and they, they are just workhorses. So I have always been happy with the Cuisinart brand. I went to the Breville this time because um, I had read some good things about it when my Cuisinart broke down the last time. So um, kind of depends on your budget. They're all different price points. One thing I have found is that the larger the bowl you can get that will fit on your counter that you've got space for, the more I think flexible it'll be for your needs because having a big bowl can be really handy. So I think, you know, 12 14, some are 16, but at least a 12 cup bowl, I think is helpful so that you can accommodate a larger batch of ingredients. Can you say again, the name of your current blender? I don't know if I'm familiar with that brand. Breville, B-R-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Yeah, okay. they also make toaster ovens um, mm. and um, 
waffle makers and ice cream makers, lots of good, lots of good things mm. there. Um, I, I like them a lot. Okay. All right. Very nice. Um, okay. The next question was for Michelle, but I'll just throw it out there to you. Um, <laughs> Vicki, someone did kind of give a suggestion in the chat as well. Um, but for Michelle's raw zucchini uh, cannelloni, they're wondering if there was a substitute for pine nuts. Um, someone suggested in the chat that walnuts could be used, but I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. You know, I think that, and I will let Michelle answer this um, better than I can, but I think if you, for some people, certain nuts are not acceptable in their diet, there might be an allergy or they're avoiding them for some reason. So you can definitely swap out different nuts in terms of flavor. Um, almonds might work um, if you're looking for something creamier, you know, maybe cashews, but if it's kind of a, a, a nutty taste, then maybe something like an I mean, that seems like a pun, but some nuts definitely have more flavor. So, um, I, you know, maybe almonds would work for something like that. But if you're avoiding nuts entirely, then you might even want to look at beans or some other kind of product instead. But I'll let Michelle um, answer that better than I can for her recipe. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for your insight anyway. Um, and yeah, I, Unfortunately, don't have marked down who asked that, um, but if you are still here, um, I did put Michelle's email in the chat. So if you are interested in more information, definitely feel free to reach out to her. Okay, the next question um, is for you, Vicki, about your tempeh burgers. In the beginning, someone was wondering how long you microwaved your sweet potato. The sweet potato that I used, which is about this size, um, you know, enough to make about a cup and a half of um, sweet potato mashed afterwards or uh, cubed. Um, I did for four minutes in my microwave. It was, that's all, just four minutes. Um, I had three different potatoes that I made today and one of them took five. They were all about the same size though. So I don't know if there's a maybe slightly different moisture level in the um, potato in the sweet potato that made it take it a little different amount of time to cook but around four so you might start at three or four and again it di also depends on the size of your microwave and the number of watts because a uh, certain you know a smaller one smaller microwave may require a little more time okay so that's something that does take a little experimenting and the, you know the more you do make them in your microwave the more you might get kind of used to what to expect from a certain size but i'm still surprised from time to time how you know how long things take sometimes a little bit longer sure absolutely all right um the next question is someone was wondering if the brownies can be frozen they definitely can be frozen yes and that's one of the nicest things about making a large batch of something like this, um, because you can have, you can stick it in the freezer without feeling like, oh, I better finish all of this be, so they don't, you know, dry up or go bad or something. Yes, you know, enjoy a few today and maybe tomorrow and then freeze what's left over so that you can have it later in the week or, uh, you know, a couple weeks from now even. So I would usually take these out of the silicone mold and I would put them into a freezer safe um, zippered bag and try to get as much air out of it as I can and then just stick them in the freezer. And then when I want a little treat or somebody else does, you can just pull out a couple of them and either let them thaw or even microwave them and kind of get them back to feeling like a nice warm brownie out of the oven. So really good in the afternoon with a cup of coffee or in the evening for a special treat. Mm -hmm. Oof, yeah, that sounds delicious. Such a good idea to always have like a back stock of brownie bites. <laughs> what more you do know, you want? I think so, <laughs> right, because I think so. Because if you don't have something that you like that satisfies that sweet urge, and again, there's no actual sugar, it's just sweetened with the fruit, The the dates, the strawberries, the bananas, which is lots of fruit. Um, you know, if you don't have something, you know, you might be tempted to do something that later you'd feel that you were sorry that you ate. So it's just nice to have surround yourself with things that you know you um, will feel good at the end of the day after eating. Absolutely. Very, very true. 
All right, the next question is someone was wondering where you can find vanilla powder. I know this was something Michelle was using, but probably. Yeah, I, I use that as well. And hmm. that I get on Amazon and you um, can kind of search around. There's more than one brand and to see which, you know, just kind of check the labels and see, check the pricing. And um, it does feel kind of expensive. However, that package will last you like forever. So because you only need a little bit, you're using half the amount that you would of an extract. So I use both. I have the powder on hand as well. And sometimes I need a little moisture. So I'm letting the extract do that for me. But sometimes you want to avoid it because um, this actually does have, um, let's see, this one is, has a little alcohol in it. Some people want to avoid that. Um, I don't mind when it's being baked off, but otherwise, you know, if it's something raw, I often will use the powder instead. Sure, absolutely. Okay, very nice. Um, okay, looks like we just have one more question. Um, someone said they're new to being vegan and they're wondering, do nuts always get soaked first? So if you, and that's a great question. And, um, you know, if you are turning the nuts into kind of a creamy consistency, a sauce, a dressing, um, something like that, then if you soak them, you'll be able to blend them better. So, you know, it kind of depends what the use is. If you're just putting them sprinkled dry on top of a salad, no need to do anything like that because they're good crunchy. But if you're turning it into a blended um, final product, soaking them will help ensure just like it does with the dates if you're soaking them that you end up with the creamy texture that you're looking for um, however if you have a vitamix or something like that a high powered blender of a different brand um, you don't need to soak cashews um, i won't say that you don't need to soak anything ever but the cashews really blend up just beautifully without soaking however if you don't have a high powered blender you just have um, a traditional standard blender, then soaking is a good idea because you will definitely get a creamier texture than you will if you, you know, if you don't soak. Hope that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. All right. I guess well, I have a quick question. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with, with the cashews, did you soak the cashews when you made the burgers? I mean, no, not the burgers, the coleslaw. The when dressing. You, with the dressing. Great question. I did not because I use a Vitamix, um, which is a very, you're looking at my, my breville, but I was using a Vitamix high powered blender. So it's such a powerful blade and mm -hmm. it goes at such a fast um, pace that, you know, such a, it's, it's a tremendously powerful. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it pulverizes it and creams it. So no, we didn't, I didn't need to do that at all. But um, I do, I have worked with clients in their home who didn't have that, just had like a regular, you know, a Hamilton Beach or, a, you know, just a, a different brand that wasn't as powerful. And it does end up having a texture that's a little more like um, a little bit, uh, I mean, you have the nuts aren't entirely pulverized. So I will say it's sort of like if, if you can kind of picture nut butter, that's a little crunchy. So mm. it still tastes great, but the texture is a little different and, you know, will it still work in your recipe? If, yes. But if you want it to be creamy and you don't have a high power blender, just soaking it for a little while will help. 